Excellent. Good afternoon. You have asked us, AbbVie Incorporated's ethics team, to speak to you, AbbVie's board of directors, regarding our orphan drug strategy. And so today, let's begin with the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview on the Orphan Drug Act. Now, the Orphan Drug Act provides pharmaceutical companies with incentives that are subsidizing research and development costs associated with developing orphan drugs, or drugs that treat a disease with a niche population of less than 200,000 people. In fact, the period from 2001 to 2011, because of this act, has been deemed a boom period for orphan drug development, rising competition, and thriving in the industry. However, such an increase in profits does have an ethical dilemma associated with it. But the question goes from, can we do something, to should we do something, it's important to examine what the Orphan Drug Act has and its implications on the industry at large, as well as an overview in general. Imagine if you were a patient with an orphan disease, like Huntington's disease or muscular dystrophy, and you needed access to an orphan drug medication. Now, you were unable to access this medication because it was so excessively priced that you weren't able to afford it. As a result, you pass away. This is a terrible prospect, and this is something that we as a company definitely want to avoid. We want to make sure all our consumers have access to a healthy amount of medication. So today, we'll examine the Orphan Drug Act's implications on AbbVie Incorporated, as well as the industry at large, and we'll provide some recommendations to solving this problem once and for all. I'd like to pass it along to Mary, who will give an overview of the presentation at large, and specifically, the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. Thank you, Mary. As Parth mentioned, in 1983, championed by Henry Waxman, the Orphan Drug Act was passed with the goal of making treatments for rare conditions more readily available by incentivizing pharmaceutical companies to produce them. The production process of the new drug is lengthy and expensive, so pharmaceutical companies had little financial motivation to invest their time and resources into producing a drug that would impact a population too small to ever guarantee a profit. In order to alleviate some of these concerns, the Orphan Drug Act came with a number of financial incentives, including tax breaks and grants for research and development, in addition to a seven-year period of exclusivity for protection from competition above and beyond the patent. However, after the law was passed, lawmakers began to have some concerns about the way the bill was being applied in the industry, specifically concerning competition and rising prices. Over the next several years, multiple attempts were made to try and amend the language of the bill to address these concerns. And while each of these individual attempts failed, a compromise bill was eventually compiled in 1990. However, President Bush vetoed the bill, expressing concerns about how this new legislation would impact the, adversely impact the production of orphan drugs as a whole. Since then, the Orphan Drug Act and its impacts have been the subject of heated debate, but with no real change in the language of the bill, pharmaceutical companies are still free to use the legislative loopholes in the law for their own profits. Helene will now tell us a little bit more about Abby. So before we move on to talking about how Abby uses the Orphan Drugs Act, let's talk a little bit, a little bit about Abby itself and what's, what, is it, what, is corp, uh, what is the corporate culture of the company. So first of all, Abby has been researching and developing. It's a pharmaceutical company that has been researching and developing for about 130 years. It used to be under Abbott, but recently in 2013, it moved up. It spun out of Abbott, and now it is an independent company as uh, Abby. So it has been an independent country for four years, and so the culture of the company, as a, as a young company, it is not as uh, the culture is not fully grown and it is still developing because it has been independent for four, only four years and this is their chance to make the changes that they always wanted to as a company and the culture. So in one of the responses that uh, we gave to, on the glass door to one of the employees talking about the culture of the company, they responded that yes, we are actively trying to work on our culture because it is the cornerstone for the success of our company as a biopharmaceutical company. So let's talk about the four um, values that Abby has. First of all, the first value is pioneering. They are committed to using the high-tech science in producing the goods, uh, in innovating, using the innovative ideas, in uh, making medicines that benefit the customers. It is a cornerstone for their business, so they commit a lot of time and resources into this. Second, we have achieving. Achieving in the sense that it is customer-focused outcomes, and they try to be, uh, they have world-class execution. They are currently 
in uh, they are their products are being exported in more than 170 countries. So the third one is caring, caring for the people, caring uh, for the people they work with, their customers. Um, they. The people there, we are focused on, we have great passion for the people we serve as well as the communities we work in. And also, the last one is enduring. We are proud of our 130 years old heritage. We have built off of that. And now we're, now we're investing in the future so that we can be a long lasting company to serve the communities in the world. Now I would like to pass it on back to Mary to talk more about how orphan drugs are used by athletes. In addition to simply being a part of the pharmaceutical industry, the Orphan Drug Act impacts AbbVie in a big way. Presently, AbbVie sells a number of drugs with orphan drug designations, primarily focused on the treatment of rare pediatric conditions. As it happens, Humira, a drug typically used to treat psoriasis and arthritis in adults, falls into this category, having been granted orphan drug designations for treatments um, for conditions such as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. In all, Humira has been granted five orphan drug designations, each coming with an additional seven years of protection from competition through the exclusivity period. In fact, Humira has been exclusive since 2008 and will not fall out of an exclusivity period until 2023. With over a decade of protection through exclusivity, some would argue that AbbVie is using the Orphan Drug Act to edge out competition rather than further innovation. However, Abby maintains that our purpose in pursuing orphan drug designations is exactly innovation rather than exploitation. We view the use of Humira and the versatility of orphan drugs in general as a way to meet the needs of the underserved. As Mike said, Executive Vice President and Research and Development Chief Scientific Officer Plissett, these approvals reflect our ongoing focus on innovating with Humira to meet the critical unmet needs of our patients. Abby clearly intends to continue to pursue orphan drug designations for our products, which is fantastic, as long as those approvals help us to alleviate the ails of those suffering with their conditions. However, it is essential that we take into account the ethical complications that this strategy raises. To discuss the industrial implications first, I will turn it over to Park. Thank you, Mary. So for the industrial implications, we'll begin with a three-part analysis. First, we'll focus on the legal implications, second, the financial, and finally, the ethical implications of the orphan drug act. So to begin, the legal implications are vast and profound. However, it's important to recognize that absolutely everything we're doing here in Abbey is not illegal. It's completely in accordance with the law. However, as a company, we answer to our shareholders, and we're trying to use and justify the Orphan Drug Act for our excessive prices, which maximizes short-term profits. However, we fundamentally believe that if we are to close these loopholes, we can maximize long-term shareholder benefits. This example of Amazon comes into mind. Amazon, as we all know, is the world's largest online retailer. And in recent years, Congress has been pressured to add taxes to online purchases. Amazon stepped ahead of the curve, started playing the game rather than sitting on the sidelines, and implemented an infrastructure to accommodate and accrue taxes within their own databases. So that way, whenever you buy something from Amazon, tax is already included. This is great news, because instead of Congress coercing Amazon to spend and pay different taxes, as well as implement a tax structure within their business, it actually consulted Amazon to craft a piece of legislation so that other online companies also have to conform to this tax mechanism. We want Abby, our company, to be at the forefront of the pharmaceutical industry. And by closing these loopholes, annihilating the ethical problems associated with this, and stepping up and emerging as a leader in terms of drug crafting and drug creation, we too can take the position just like Amazon did in the online retail business, except for us in the pharmaceutical industry. Additionally, the financial implications of the Orphan Drug Act are also profound. The main financial implication of this drug act and what it does is that it subsidizes research and development costs for orphan drugs by up to 50%. However, when looking at the numbers, specifically in our development costs, we see that the development costs for orphan drugs are about the same as the development costs for non-orphan drugs. So why are we using the Orphan Drug Act to justify these excessive prices in the orphan drug category, even though it costs about the same and we are subsidized for it compared to the non-orphan drugs? It's also important to examine that orphan drugs have made up over $567 billion in sales over the past year, whereas non-orphan drugs have made $568 billion. Roughly half of the profit in the industry comes from orphan drugs. 
But that doesn't make any sense, seeing as though the legislation was originally intended for niche markets of less than 200,000 people. If we're only supposed to be marketing to less than 200,000 people, how are we making roughly 50% of the profits? These profits are projected to grow. In fact, Humira, our biggest selling drug, is projected to grow at a rate of 16% per year in terms of profit. And orphan drugs by 2020 are projected to make up 70% of the entire pharmaceutical industry. Now, I'm all for increasing our profits, and we all increased the research and development costs within the orphan drugs. However, to maximize long-term shareholder rights and long-term shareholder maximization, we have to focus on closing these loopholes, reconciling these differences, and using the Orphan Drug Act as well as its designation for what the law originally intended. We can emerge as a leader, and if we take this opportunity, we can become the forefront of the pharmaceutical industry in the very near future. I'd also like to pass it off to Kayone, who will discuss specifically the ethical implications of the law. We go on to how Abby, as well as the industry, can reconcile these differences. Thank you, Pat. As my colleagues have previously, have previously mentioned, companies in this orphan drug industry are using the loopholes in the law to benefit themselves at the expense of consumers. They are using the law for purposes for which it was not originally intended. This creates a legal issue, an ethical issue. To discuss these, this ethical issues, we're going to talk about three main points, namely excessive pricing, multiple pills of exclusivity, and the use of common drugs as orphan drugs. First, I will talk about excessive pricing. Companies that produce orphan drugs receive government subsidies. These subsidies greatly reduce the costs that they incur when they produce these drugs. One would expect them to pass these low costs to consumers so that the price to, to consumers is low. However, often drugs are way more expensive than non-often drugs. This is because companies charge excessive prices to, to customers as a result of being afforded the seven-year exclusivity period in which they are protected from competition. Companies take advantage, take advantage of the power difference over customers who cannot negotiate prices as there's no competition in the market. So companies use this law to maximize their profits rather than use it for its original intention, which was to incentivize companies to produce drugs for rare diseases with the expectation that they wouldn't make huge profits as they would be making these drugs for a small population. Helping the sick by taking advantage of their helplessness is absolutely unethical. Next, Mary will talk about another aspect of ethics as it pertains to this industry, which is about exclusivity. Thank you, Pam. It's important when, it, that's when examining a trend such as the one shown on this graph to make the distinction between patent protection and the seven-year exclusivity period provided by the Orphan Drug Act. You may wonder why an exclusivity period was necessary at all when pharmaceutical companies could protect their drugs through a patent. But this consideration was added to the legislation after reviewing the process of creating a new drug. Patent protection gives an inventor exclusive rights to his or her invention for 20 years, provided that the mechanism behind the invention is fully disclosed. However, according to Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Researchers and Manufacturers of America, it can take upwards of around average of 15 years to get a drug ready to go to market. So by the time a company is actually ready to sell the product that they've spent the, over a decade producing, they only have a few, left, a few years of patent protection left. The seven-year exclusivity period provided by the Orphan Drug Act prohibits and delays the approval of competing drugs, adding another layer of protection. However, while this addition to the legislation was intended to address a legitimate business concern, here we see a trend of the industry moving in a slightly to slightly ethically ambiguous territory. When a drug is granted a orphan drug designation and a company finds through further investigation that the same drug can be used to treat another rare condition, they can apply for another orphan drug designation. If this application is approved, another year, another seven years of exclusivity is granted to the drug. As we can see, the number of secondary and tertiary primary uh, orphan drug approvals has grown as time has gone on. So there has been less competition as a result. The Orphan Drug Act was founded and passed with the idea of promoting innovation and in treatments for rare conditions. But the lack of competition that secondary and tertiary and primary orphan drug approvals creates edges out competition and, by, and through that vein 
hinders innovation, depriving consumers of reasonably tried drugs and better drugs. Now, Parth will talk some more about the common drugs we see in the industry. So as Mary was discussing, this trend is increasingly growing and in past years has grown and exploded. If you look at this chart, it's basically a bar graph of all the different, most common drugs used in the world today. And we can see our number one seller, Humira, is second in terms of the most common. Additionally, the drugs in bold are those given orphan drug status. Now, let's reconcile this with the fact that the Orphan Drug Act was originally intended for niche markets of less than 200,000 people. Yet, for example, in our company, Humira, it makes $8.41 billion, and it's the second most common drug out there. This doesn't seem to make sense, and compounded with the statistic that recently stated that 70 of the most common drugs in the world were recently given orphan drug status, it seems as though this problem is continually compounding upon itself, and more and more drugs are unnecessarily being given orphan drug status and excessively priced to reap the benefit of profit. Now, I completely understand and sympathize with the fact that we, as a company, with, for example, Humira, put in the time and money to research and develop this drug. Why shouldn't we benefit from the profits? And I like capitalism just as much as the next guy, but we also have to understand that our company doesn't deal with luxury goods. It also has a humanitarian aspect to it. People need our drugs to prolong their lives and increase the quality of their lives. We try to find line between ethics as well as profit. We have to be sure that both of these categories are met with full fruition and that all of our stakeholders, from our shareholders to our consumers, are satisfied with our product. It's something we can be proud of. Now, I'd like to pass it back on to Mary, who will give some recommendations of how we can reconcile these differences, solve these ethical dilemmas, and improve the quality as well as the outlook for the industry at large in the near future. Thank you, Parth. As Parth just said, we have examined these issues in detail and have come up with some recommendations we would like Abby to consider moving forward to help alleviate these problems. Our primary recommendation involves Abby taking a proactive role in promoting the ethical use of the Orphan Drug Act by reviewing the pricing policy of the company. Abby has not been accused of excessive pricing, but it is a peril to be aware of in the industry, and special care must be taken to review the costs and revenues incurred by the company in the production of orphan drugs. Reviewing Abby's pricing policy may mean that the company in the very short term sacrifices some revenues. However, by adopting a responsible pricing policy that garners the trust and loyalty of consumers, we stand to put ourselves in a position of long-term gains and stability. Additionally, the price hikes that we've seen from other pharmaceutical companies are absolutely allowed by the Act, but it's important to consider the ethical and legal implications of taking advantage of this legislation. For example, the, uh, the idea of staying ahead of the curve with legislation has brought up several, been brought up several times. And self-regulating on pricing allows Abby to do just that, and minimizes the possibility that unfavorable restrictions will be imposed upon us in the future, and allows us to be an active participant in the discussion. Additionally, approaching Abby's pricing policy from an ethical standpoint ensures that we are conscious about the core values and company standards we've set forth for ourselves by making sure that we are not taking advantage of the power difference that exists between us and consumers that are depending on us for life-saving medication. This recommendation protects our consumers, our reputation, and sets a positive example in the industry. Billy and E will talk a little bit more about our second recommendation. So the second recommendation that we want to give is setting a responsible industry standard by working with pharma. Pharma is the trade group that represents all the companies that are in the pharmaceutical industry of the United States. So, well, you may ask that why should we get involved? We're doing great as a company. Why should we get involved with these things that are going outside of our company? Yes, absolutely true. We are doing great as a company. We are making profits. We're innovating new medicines that are helping the customers. We are putting our resources and time in this, um, in our values of uh, innovating and also caring. But the problem is that every time we are doing something, we are faced with conflicts of interest. And as employees of Abby, we want to make sure that we do not fall into the same slippery downhill road of self-destruction like other companies within the industry have already fallen into. So that is why it, we are recommending to work with pharma in uh, setting higher industri industry standards. So one of the ways that we are saying to uh, set higher industry standards is by creating this integrity pact. 
uh, which is similar to the Defense Industry Initiative. So when uh, the United States were preparing to combat the Soviets at that time, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, corruption going on. A lot of there was an, uh, there was uncertainty, and uh, the industry was not transparent. So one of the things that all the CEOs of the companies did is they came together and they created the uh, Defense Industry Initiative, where they said that we will be more transparent. We want to. Uh, we want to make sure that our industry is not as corrupt. So um, what they ended up doing is uh, they everybody signed the contract. And as of now, the industry is much more reliable. It is more transparent. And it has had a really great impact. So we want to take the similar concept and put it into this industry. We want to, as of now, our uh, pharma has a lot of co uh, has codes as well as other um, Regulations set in place that all the companies who have the orphan drug designation, designation they have to abide by those rules. And we just want to add on to that by saying that let's have an integrity pact where at any person who applies for the orphan drug status, they have to sign that agreement. And we want to we want all the CEOs to sign it on a yearly basis. So it's a constant reminder for them to be 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 ethical in that uh, in their actions and also to uh, you, the responsibilities they are given, the resources they are given, they are using it in the most efficient way. So by by mo motivating and um, inspiring the CEOs, they will inspire the companies, their companies, their employees, which will overall uh, help their company act more ethically and that way we can increase the industry standard. So while we're doing that, we, we understand that it will require a lot of time, a lot of energy as well as finances. In short term, it will require all of that, but in long run, we'll be able to set higher industry standards. And why do we care about that? It really aligns with our value for caring, caring for the people we work with. And by doing this, we will be setting up higher standard for our industry. Moreover, by doing taking being the leader, taking this initiative instead of just laying back and watching, we will really uh, we will really win the trust of our customers, which will give us a stronger customer base and it will help us stay in business with a longer time, which also aligns with our uh, with our value of um, staying long in business. Um, and lastly it is our all, um, all things aside, it is the right thing to do as we have a duty to care for the people that we work with, with our customers. So no matter what the, uh, the effects are, we still have a right to, our, uh, to act upon what is going on. Now I'd like to pass it on to Kaunik to talk about the recommendation. Thank you, Haile. Indeed, one of our values, which is pioneering, um, relates to what she has just said. We want to be pioneers, not just in innovation, but in setting good, high standards and um, moral principles within the industry. Now, our last recommendation is to lobby for changes in legislation. We recommend that AVI lobby for the legislators to provide incentives that are proportional to the monetary successes associated with the marketing of orphan, drug, orphan drugs. This is to say, if an orphan drug manufacturer makes Profits that that makes profit so that it can afford to cover its costs. It should not be given the same amount of incentives as a company that cannot make huge profit so that it cannot be able to meet its costs. For example, for companies that make really huge profits on their orphan drugs, we recommend that the, the tax breaks be reduced. Also, another specific example of lobbying for changes in legislation include um, reducing the, the exclusivity period for companies that produce common drugs that are also orphan drugs. This allows other companies to research and develop on these common drugs for other users and also increases competition and ensures that, company, ensures that customers can negotiate for reasonable prices for these drugs which are also used as common drugs. The ethical implication of this recommendation is that we are closing these loopholes and ensuring that the law is used to benefit customers more than it is used to benefit companies, which was its original intention. The financial implication of this recommendation is that 
it will definitely limit how much profits com pharmaceutical companies can make from orphan drugs. And this does not align with the moral and legal responsibility of companies to maximize shareholder wealth. However, to defend our solution, I'm going, I'm going to go into the legal implication. By going to the legislators and lobbying for these changes, we are shielding ourselves from potential future legislation. Currently, there's so much criticism about ethics from the public, from stakeholders, from different parties about ethics in the offense drug industry. By going to this legislative, this, the legislative body and suggesting these changes, we are showing them that we know what is happening in, the, in, our, in, in, our, in our industry. We are aware of the unethical behavior that companies are, are doing. And this, this establishes trust and helps us improve our relationships with the legislators and build common ground, which can be helpful for us in the long term as we continue producing orphan drugs. We are living in a time where everything is constantly changing. Surprisingly, not a lot of changes have been done to the Orphan Drugs Act. Well, with the rising concerns among the customers, among the legislatures, as well as the insurance companies, the change is inevitable. The question is, who will lead the change? Who will facilitate the change that is coming? We want Adway to be the change and facilitate the change that is coming towards us. It is crucial to stand up in these times of ethical dilemmas because if we do not, then somebody else will. We want to be the change, we want to lead the change, and it is very important for us to do that. Another reason why is because we need to stand up and show the company, show the industry that no matter what you produce, you are in this basic business of human being well-being, right? So by showing, by reminding people that your first uh, priority should be the well-being of a human, uh, we will be motivating a more ethical, uh, more ethical company culture that everybody will want to abide to. Um, we want our company to uh, commit ourselves to caring for the human well-being and facilitate the change that is constantly coming. Uh, the question, the problem is simple. Is it legal? Yes, everything we are doing is indeed legal. But the real question is, should we do it? Thank you. At this time, we'd like to open up the floor to our board of directors for any questions you may have. Thank you. Would you mind getting back to your first slide? I think it's your values. Could you put those back up again? We'll get there. Is this what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that you want the company to take a short-term hit to become an industry leader, correct? Do you know exactly, can you make any estimates as to exactly what kind of financial hit you're talking about? So, Humira, our number one selling drug, let's just take that for an example. Great. Humira is growing at a rate of 16% per year, as I said earlier on in the presentation. Now, with any of these changes that we make, either it's the legislation reducing the subsidy that we get for the research and development of the drug, or we simply reduce our pricing, that profit margin is going to substantially decrease. We estimate, and we've done these facts as well as researched it, that the profit margin with these changes could change to negative 5% for the next four to five years. So we'd be losing money for yes. the next four to five years. However, the benefit of this drug is that after these patents expire, after these exclusivity periods end, we can still find a new way of increasing profits because by increasing the amount of drugs and changing the isomers within these drugs, we can renew our patents and we can find other legal and ethical ways to boost these profits. So after these five years of short-term loss, our shareholders will recognize that we're doing the right thing and we estimate that the profit margin could go back up to being 10 to 11% as what it is growing in the future. And I guess have you anticipated what a 5% loss a year in our revenues for this one drug would be multiplied by all of the other drugs that would be affected and how that would play out in our need to cut staff, in our need to to cut I mean to, to cut employees, to, to to 
to be at war with our shareholders who our stock price will inevitably be affected because people aren't interested in having the stock price of the company that they're investing in significantly go down. Absolutely, and we completely understand and sympathize right. with that concern. Um, and so just to give you the other statistic is that 50% of our company is made up of orphan drugs and the other 50% does have enough of a profit margin to make sure that our shareholder or our shares don't decrease in value over time. So we'll still be able to pay those dividends, um, we'll still be able to meet up with our payments, and nothing else will be lost in our company. It's just for that one specific drug that the profit will decrease. But overall, the company the company is still projected to grow at a rate of 30%, so in comparison to the six to the negative five percent loss, or the 16% currently growing in Humera, the 30% is a substantially larger amount of growth that we have overall in the company. In addition to that, if we combine the reduction in prices with the changes in legislation um, recommendations that I've talked about, so if a drug is expected to make uh, negative profits or losses, then, like, like I have mentioned, we have said that the incentives should be proportional to the monetary successes. So drugs that make really huge profits, their incentives should be low because they can afford to pay those. But drugs that are expected to make losses, then the incentives will be more. Will, should be more. So if we combine those two recommendations, companies will not really make losses because if they are if if they are expected to make a loss, then the incentives will be more. If the legislative body accepts our recommendation, so companies will not make losses, but they will just make. Um, not excessive profits. Absolutely, and just to piggyback off of that one more time, um, we don't want to end up like, for example, Enron, Arthur Anderson, and the list goes on and on of public companies that have had an ethical dilemma um, discovered by the shareholders at large, and then it's a public outcry with a tanking of the share price. So rather than making the industry wait until some big dilemma happens, we're planning on fixing the problem now so that our maximization, our shareholders, can have the best benefit in the long term, in the future and in the value of the stock price for the longevity of how the long abbey stays as a fluent and liquid company. Two questions. First, enduring. I missed the explanation of enduring due to distraction. Yes, absolutely. Enduring, uh, uh, Abbey has been in business for about 120 years, 130 years uh, to be accurate. Um, they, are, they take pride in their longevity, but now that they have separated, they are investing in their future. They're trying um, new things. They're um, expanding in new countries. So they're investing in the futures so that they stay in business even longer. So that is one of their uh, values. The second question is how do we calculate this excessive profit? Is that revenue net less what? Costs, burden costs? Revenue, yes. yes. So it is uh, revenues minus the research and development costs associated with that, and then the costs of marketing, um, the costs of uh, getting the drug out there, transportation and distribution costs as well. Just direct costs? Just direct costs, and product costs specifically, yes. So you're not counting over it. Oh, even all costs are part of Well, it's a burden rate. It's a burden cost. It's not just direct costs, it's a burden cost. Yes. Profits may not be excessive. Yeah, well, profits, excessive profits come from the revenue part, the excessive pricing. That's where excessive. You're talking about excessive pricing, but that's not excessive profits. Um, I would like to, sorry, I would like to point out that in short term, we may face some losses. We are in a place where we are charging more than we should. Um, if not uh, specifically the, the industry in general, a lot of companies are taking advantage of this Orphan Drugs Act. So we are charging more than we should be originally. So it's not going to be a win-win situation. We will be facing loss for a short term, but in long term, ethically, we'll be doing what is right, as well as the long term gains will outperform the short term losses that we may face for a couple of years. So the losses, uh, understand that we will face losses, but I, I, we believe that the long term um, gains that we will gain as ethically or financially, it will compensate for it. Here's the assertion that we're charging more than we should. It's the evidence that we are. The um, evidence comes from the exclusionary rights that we have to selling the drug. So as a result of this, we can do monopolistic profits on that specific drug rather than perfect competition profits. And so that's why revenues are artificially inflated in comparison to if this was a perfect, perfectly competitive model, there would be more industries creating 
the drug and competitive with other generic brands or other off brands. And as a result of that, the increase in competition would decrease the revenues, decreasing our costs at large. So yes, you're absolutely right. There are um, direct labor, direct materials, overhead costs, and period costs associated with developing the drug. Um, but as a result of the fact that all the demand is encapsulated by just our company, with the example, for example, with Humira, uh, we're able to charge the monopolistic price rather than the perfectly competitive price. Okay. Um, just to say that um, companies, yes, use excessive pricing to um, revenue affects profits. So if revenues are excessive, the profit is also going to be excessive. Secondly, um, in terms of how we measure, how we, how we can say that the price is excessive, I'm going to talk, talk about an example in the industry, not specifically Avi. Marathon Pharmaceuticals this year announced an orphan drug and Flaza, whose price was $89,000 per annum per patient. However, patients have been able to buy this drug from other countries. It had, um, it had the exclusivity and the orphan drug designation just in the USA. But patients of the, of the disease that Flaza treated have been able to buy it from other countries for less than $1,000. And this raised um, negative public reactions, resulting in uh, Marathon Pharmaceuticals Delaying the launch of its, um, its delaying the launch of its drug. So, in in the case of Marathon Pharmaceuticals, there was a drug that just had a different name in other countries, and in that case, we could see the price difference of of actually the same drug. We could see that Marathon charges eighty nine thousand. Other country, other companies in other, in other countries charge. Um, a lower price for that. They have the same cost, but Marathon decided to charge 89,000 in for patients in the USA just because it has it has this monopoly, this exclusivity. You make the case for case by case evaluation, not a blanket. But it was me to see the data that is true. Address that question from two angles. Uh, even though I don't think financial is the main idea here, but your argument that excessive profit exists, therefore it's unethical, uh, has to be, uh, I guess, uh, uh, based on your assumption that uh, we either have a high margin relative to other drugs that we sell, or we are shifting costs to this drug more than we should, or we're shifting costs to other drugs more than we should. Are, are we doing any of that that you consider to be unethical? Um, I would say that the being ethical and unethical, uh, you are committing your time and resources in, produ in the production of this orphan drug. Yes, you have right to earn profits. That is ethical. The problem becomes unethical when you are taking profits more than you deserve and the product that you initially started the production for, which was to help the people, to uh, help them save their lives, right? When you forget that and you start focusing on getting the most profits to gain uh, more equity or more shareholders, that is when the problem, uh, that, that is the main problem and that is the unethical aspect of it is when you get, when you take more profits than you actually deserve or uh, that you should get so that. Okay. The, uh, well, what, I, what I was asked is what is the evidence that I, we are doing that, that we are doing accounting trades or computations or pricings that is excessive and unethical therefore. Yeah, well, um, okay, so the revenue from orphan drugs increases, the, the price hikes are really large, but we don't see a proportional increase in the costs. So the only explanation to that is that the revenues are being increased while revenue, while uh, the costs are not increasing. So that means we are continuing to increase our prices that we cannot justify with increasing costs. So and just to give you an example with our company, um, Humera, for example, has, get, has get gotten the exclusivity rights for this country. But as I'm sure we all know as the board of directors, the patent for Humera did expire at the end of 2016. So what we did as a company was we established a plant in Singapore to get the exclusive rights over there. So as a result of this, if you look at the profit margins in comparison to the United States and then the rest of the world for Humera and other like drugs, 
the costs are relatively the same in terms of developing, distributing, and creating and manufacturing the drug, but the revenues here in America are priced significantly higher than in other countries for the same basic drug, for the same basic chemical with different isomers and the molecular level. So the drug does the same thing, but the revenues are disproportionately skewed, as you were saying earlier on, rather than the costs. So, uh I got a normal question, and that is, your recommendation on pro lobby to change the law. Uh, is that the only way to do ethical work or ethical production and ethical business? Ethical, or can you just do what you're doing the right way and be fine without? I don't know whether lobbying is an ethical thing or not. Absolutely, we, we share and sympathize with that concern. And so that's why one of our other recommendations was just like the defense industry did back in the 1960s and 70s was the defense industry initiative, which is they had no government intervention at all. It was just the CEOs and the businesses coming together to create an integrity pact. So that's one of our other solutions as well. And like you said, the best case scenario is us for not to spend money on lobbying or not to spend money on anything like that, or nothing extra, but rather just focus on all the companies together uh, making sure that the integrity is upheld and the prices of the drugs are accurate and fair and proportional to whatever the price is. So that's, yeah, that was definitely our second recommendation um, was to do that just like the defense industry, except for the pharmaceutical industry, and have pharma institute an integrity path that is industry-wide rather than something that has to be lobbied through legislation through Congress. The defense industry didn't control pricing. But it was a problem of um, integrity. Uh, and uh, I feel like when the leaders come in and they say that we want to change, we want to make a difference, we want to change however things are right now, they can influence their followers, they can influence the people that work under them. And that is one of the things uh, we want, is for them to come in, Work, uh, we work with them and have this integrity pact and when somebody doesn't abide by them, there isn't uh, taking away their rights, it's more um, can you, uh, they calling them in for questioning that why did you do what you did, is it justified, not justified, and also uh, publicly denouncing them. That way the people are involved with this whole process. When you make a problem, uh, a social problem, when you make this uh, unethical here a social problem instead of just the company's problem who's being unethical, when people are aware of the unethical behaviors of the company, they will take action. And with the fear of losing those customers, we think that the, the CEOs, the companies, will be leaning towards uh, acting more actively than So, different ways of um, in getting the CEOs involved and uh, starting the conversation about the ethics and why the CEOs came together and the defense industry is very different from the situation we have here. Isn't it true that the CEOs in the defense industry were under attack from Congress because they were, um, what they were charging and the, the lack of credibility that was happening, they were acting before action was taken on them? So, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so that's a really different dynamic here in terms of incentive. Isn't it? People came together because they wanted to do it themselves before they ended up losing all government work and before they ended up being regulated. And encouraged by the presidential commission. Absolutely. But so you don't have the same conditions here as you're asking us. You know, get granted you're pointing out our, our, our value is pioneering. But by the same token, just as we might pioneer to clean up the industry's policies toward orphan drugs, part of our pioneering is us as innovators for drugs. And the money that we would be losing, you don't know that that isn't the very money that we need to stay on top of helping save lives because of the drugs we will be developing. So we have a, a, a dynamic here that I'm not satisfied that you have given me a compelling reason and saying that we're taking more profits than we deserve is a statement you can't substantiate. It's an assumption, but on behalf of the company, your salary and other things are being paid as a result of how the company is doing. So I guess I need more specific information about why it is that we should step into a situation that you rightly point out we're not doing anything illegal. 
and why would any of our colleagues in the industry decide they would work with us to come up with an integrity pack when I suspect everyone feels the way we do, that we're operating with integrity. Absolutely, and so that's why our first solution, we think is the best solution, is for Abby to just step up to the plate and do the right thing in the first place. And that was with the example and of And what Amazon. is the right thing? So the, the right thing is to price the drug as though it was in a perfectly competitive market, or as though it's justified enough to where we meet the costs and then make a substantial amount of profit to keep the company running, keep the drug line running, and keep the whole vein of the industry strong. Um, so just to give you the other example with Amazon, what Amazon did is they were having no, no legal problems as well. Um, at that time, tax and tax on online purchases wasn't a problem, wasn't a legal ethic. And in fact, it was it was not illegal to charge no taxes. However, Amazon stepped up to the plate, recognized that if shareholders and if the public find out about this, there may be some sort of outcry in the future so that they implemented a tax structure within their company themselves without Congress, without the help of other online retailers. And so as a result, they became the industry lead. And so when Congress decided to draft legislation on taxes for online purchases, Congress consulted Amazon, and Amazon's actually the crafter, basically, of the legislation. Many of the ideas that are in that legislation are, to, are based on Amazon's pricing model, are based on Amazon's tax structure. So that's what we want for Abby. We're not necessarily saying that everyone else has to do this at this moment, but if Abby steps up to the plate, if Abby's the one that takes the charge and takes the lead in pricing these drugs at the appropriate level, whatever that may be to have organizational sustainability as well as um, drug sustainability, then Abby can be the one to be the consultant for Congress rather than being the one that's subdued into following specific Do you have any evidence that the way we price drugs is causing people to die or to not get the medication they need? The exclusivity period is more the problem than pricing in terms of Humira in general. The arguments that come against us are saying that we are promoting monopolistic pricing because we continue to apply for open drug designations with incredibly minute changes in the population that we're treating. For example, we have a designation for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis for two to four year olds and then for four to six year olds. So. People are having a difficult time justifying that extra seven years of exclusivity just based on two years difference in the children that we give this drug to. This is the concern that's um, Who is having trouble with that? Consumers, watchdogs, people who are involved in the pharmaceutical industry well, and keeping track of this exact problem, the abuses of the Open Drug Act that we've been watching and hearing outcry for, for example, from Marathon Pharmaceuticals, other companies as well. We are, the theme of our recommendations is to be proactive and protect ourselves from the coming storm. Because while we may face short-term losses, the losses that we'll face if public opinion and our consumers decide they no longer trust us um, will be far greater and more damaging and lasting to our company overall. So isn't, isn't this really a problem with administering the existing law rather than us doing something wrong. We could be whistleblower. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I can see we can help correct the administration of this orphan drug law that gives opportunity for abuse. That was kind of the idea behind our second our third recommendation of lobbying for changes in legislation. We recognize the loopholes are there. We recognize that we may not be taking advantage of them to abuse customers or abuse the system, but there is the possibility and it has been done. So we do not want those accusations to fall and land on our doorstep when we don't deserve them. So we want to be proactive and make sure that those loopholes are filled in the legislation. Absolutely, and in any case, it's better to be proactive and prevent something before it happens rather than be retroactive and have to do damage control. That would be probably sustainably worse for our shareholders, or if our stock price tanked because public outcry and public opinion shifted on AbbVie, Humira, or any other drug manufacturer. So this is necessarily, we're giving you basically a warning, a precautionary tale of we should change so that way in the future, we're better aligned in terms of our company interests, our company values, and just bettering the industry at large in general. Do you have any evidence of cost that uh, companies pay when they, when if the worst case happens to heavy meat, what financial numbers do you have that would indicate 
that what we what kind of penalties, what kinds of situations based on what's happened to other people, other other firms in similar situations. Do you have any substantial financial information that, that you could use? Yes. Yeah, so, oh. so for example, our counter company Mylan, right? Mylan sells the EpiPen, and recently, in terms of Congress, Senator Elizabeth Warren right. grilled the CEO uh, based on the excessive pricing that they had. The EpiPen's generic counterparts around the world sells for about 80% less of the cost than what it's marketed as in the United States. And the costs of developing, researching, distributing these drugs are roughly the same. So if we examine the true, because Mylan has the monopolistic um, profit scheme on simply the EpiPen, it shows that they're charging significantly more than they need to to keep the company running or to keep the branch running. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because it is legal to do so. But that change, that public outcry that resulted of it, has resulted in the company's loss of about $4 billion in terms of value. And so that's a significantly large amount of money that we, you know, we don't want that to happen to Abby. We love our company. We love working for it. We don't want our company to tank. Um, so, and as a result of that, the EpiPen costs $800, whereas Humira costs about thousands and thousands of dollars, $89,000, $4,000, right? So that loss, that difference is significantly greater than it is in the case of Mylan's. So we have the ability to lose a lot more for a lot less. Okay, thank you. We're done with the role playing, and now we're going to give you feedback in the context of wanting you to succeed tomorrow in the 10 minutes of ethics only presentation. And I certainly apologize for the appalling noise. We had no idea that was going to happen. A um, couple of things. You particularly went into the they, and it was really we and us. You really need to watch that because it, it, it changes the whole dynamic. You really got a complicated subject here. And I'm wondering how you can simplify it for tomorrow in terms of dealing with the ethics piece. Um, have you done any research on the CEO of MBB in terms of, is, is the company standing for anything in particular that would justify by what they've been involved in you building into that? Have you done anything, if you know anything about the CEO or know anything about some of the decisions that have been made that would be appropriate ethical decisions? Yes, so um, as I said before, when Humera's patent expired, the board of directors voted to create the plant in Singapore. Um, and as a result of that creation, because they're changing one small isomer or molecule in the drug, that drug is gonna get an extensive exclusivity period. But That's the CEO came out and denounced this change. So he was the one who actually voted against the creation of the plant because he was unsure with the fact that- but he lost, right? Exactly, because he was voted, the rest of the directors voted to create the plant, yeah. Okay, so I guess what I'm thinking is that to bolster your approach, it's helpful, you've got three divergent recommendations that go in very different directions. And it makes sense to be thinking about how you can make a really strong case. One of the ways is to start by saying you've invited this our employee group here to talk to you because you're concerned about these issues. These can set you up in a, in a positive sort of way. It also reminds us what the roles are here. And you've got a little bit of a disconnect. You, you say that the audience is executives, which could be the CEO and the VP and the CFO, but then you also refer to us as the board. So just be clear tomorrow whether you're talking to the board, which is different than when you're, if you're talking to executives. Thoughts? I praise your presentation skills. You did all the things I would encourage people to do. Keeping hands between waist and shoulder, gestures, and he spoke it out and very effectively. Just terrific. I do take a little exception to his chart design. The white on light green is working well for you. Some of the words for me I would were unreadable. I really liked your opening with the values of the company. You're the first team I've seen to do that. It's a very important thing to do to build on those values. In fact, for any of those values on the screen, too. Uh, we 
which is not a bad ending for your presentation to have those values up and saying, this is what you're trying to do, folks. You're trying to be pioneers and care for people. Okay. I really enjoyed your presentation. All of you did well. Your transition to the slides are perfect. You managed that very well for everybody, actually. Uh, all, all presentations were very uh, clear to me. Um, I, I would suggest, in terms of your uh, arguments, to talk about the price, uh, to talk about the cost not being shifted among products, uh, because that can create the illusion of higher or lower profit. Uh, as long as you make those two arguments, then you can say, relatively speaking, this is a most, most profitable product or highest profitable product. And that's a signal or red flag for the government or for the regulators to get in and hurt us or correct us. Uh, I can I can see lobbying the other way is a strong argument uh, because I don't know uh, whether lobbying itself is a good thing to do. Uh, I, I can want to say whistleblowing maybe recommendation to the regulators in terms of enforcing and administering the law much more effectively would be something that can go in a positive direction in that. Uh, otherwise, I think you, you, you did a good job. This is also obviously an important issue for those who buy these drugs. Uh, uh, I thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. I think your strongest case tomorrow is to pick whichever of the two out of the three recommendations that you feel you can build the most substantial fact-based around. I think it's it's too hard to go in such different directions. You won't have the use of slides tomorrow. So the ability to convey the power of the values and the ability to, are there any other stories that you've read about Abby V wanting to do the right thing that, that you can give credit for? And you're, it seems to me you're really making a pitch about leadership. You're really making a pitch not about doing the right thing because it's right, because even though we all agree with you, that's not going to change a business executive's mind. But doing the right thing proactively as a result of changes in the industry, I don't remember that you used the, the um, example of the... the um, Amazon. Uh, Myler. Oh, Myler, yes. So the Amazon and the, and the Myler are very interesting. And where does the, you could raise the question of where does the company stand in the middle of something like this? And the justification for what, do you know what's happened to Amazon? I mean, is there some tangible benefit that Amazon has had in terms of they must have had losses and they dealt with it to get to a certain place? You could make the case that, in fact, that's how true innovators move forward and pioneer a direction of change. And we know it's coming. We don't know when. We may not be the victim. But we, if we are, and then I guess the costs, a couple of, I mean, this, you're not making a financial presentation. But the, the, the element that, the, that the, the cost to the company in terms of reputation and in terms of of loss of respect and in that kind of stuff can be briefly alluded to, but you really have the responsibility tomorrow to overwhelm whoever is the person that's doing, um, that will be listening to you, to overwhelm him or her with the power of your best arguments. And you have a number of good arguments and you have some weaker arguments. So I take out the weaker arguments and I focus on what you can really build to a crescendo. In ten minutes. Anything else that you want to add to think, support that? Because we think that we want to position our company so that if indeed something does challenge us as having excessive profits, we have already documented that we're doing things the right way. We 
we've taken on that burden and we are documented, we can show that our prices are. And we've made justified. changes to ensure that. Yeah, and we have a process to ensure that that happens. Good. Anything else? Good. Good luck tomorrow. Any questions for us? Any questions of us? Okay. Thank you for your input. Good. Thank, Thank you so much. You so much. Thank you.